Good morning. How's everybody? Good. How was Thanksgiving? I know. Good. How was the food, Randy? You didn't have it at your house. I'm surprised, Randy. Well, you could have come to my house. I wish I'd have known that. It was okay. You're good. Okay, as long as you're good. You know, I was thinking. <laughs> you ate, though. I know you ate. <laughs> um, I was as I was getting ready for this. Um, preparing this sermon, as I mentioned in prayer, I was talking about preparing the way. Think about holidays, you know, there's a lot of preparation that goes on, especially for the cooks. And I was going to say women, but not, there's some men that cook too, so I had to stop just saying women. There are men that cook too. I know Dennis is a cook. And yeah, very good. Um, so yes, a lot of men are very good cooks. Randy is one of those as well. I'm a little spoiled by that. Um, but anyway, so I was just thinking about all the preparation that goes into not only Thanksgiving, but we're getting ready to go into the Christmas season. And so there's lots of preparation going into that. If you have children, there's gifts to buy. Um, you know, in your family in general, you have gifts to buy. So there's just a lot of time that we get wrapped up in getting ready for the holiday season. So, you know, it can be overwhelming. Um, and just to be completely honest and upfront, not all of us have the perfect family holidays either. Um, so it can be even more difficult if you don't have all of that. Um, for me, this year was, was very different. A good different, but very different. And so um, anyway, you just, again, holidays are just hard. And there's just a lot of preparation that goes into it. So have you ever thought about, though, the preparations that God does. He has prepared things for us. Have you ever thought about that? Um, you know, he, um, original plan for us with Adam and Eve was to live with them forever, right? That was what he, he created them. He wanted to have eternal life and live with them forever. But he gave them free will. So what did they do? They sinned. And so we lost that opportunity to have that eternal life. So that God then started preparing for us. He wanted to prepare a way that we could spend eternal life with him. And so one of those people that he used was John the Baptist. And so we're going to look at John, his life. We're going to look at four things that we can learn from him. And then we're going to dissect those four things and how we can apply those. So a little background about John. His parents were Zachariah and Elizabeth. They had tried many, many years to have a baby. And she could not get pregnant. Then when she was old, she got pregnant. And so um, there's like 400 years from what I could find out. There's like 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament. And it had been silent. And then here came John. You know, she, she got pregnant with John. And... They knew instantly that he had a calling on his life and they wanted him to fulfill that calling. So although she was old and although, um, you know, they didn't understand why they couldn't get pregnant before that, God's timing was never late, always on time. He knew that John had to be born at that specific time at that, for that specific purpose. And so he, God knew exactly what he was doing. So something for us to remember is God's timing is never late or early. God's timing is never late or early. And like I said, we're going to dive into that on us, how we can apply that later on. So now we're going to look in Matthew 3, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. We're going to learn a little bit more about John. If you want to turn there, you're more than welcome to, but it's going to be on the screen too. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who has spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. 
So as you can see by these verses, John did not live a palace life. You know, he didn't he didn't live in a, a house or anything. He he was dressed in camel's hair. Um, he ate locust and wild honey, which doesn't sound very appealing to me. Um, but he was doing what he was called to do. You know, John was doing what he, what he was supposed to do. He was, you know, God called him to do something, so he was out doing it. Regardless of the situation he was in, regardless of where he lived or what he ate, he was still doing what he was doing. People were confessing their sins, and he was baptizing them. So now let's read Mark 1.7. And it says, And this was his message. After he comes, the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. So he's talking about Jesus here, that the powerful one is coming and that he's not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. So this was his message that he was proclaiming to people. So John was out preaching, telling others about Jesus coming. And again, his sole purpose, his whole reason for being was to tell others about Jesus. That's the only reason John was here, to, to prepare the way. As I talked about earlier, I mentioned earlier, he was here to prepare the way. So he obeyed God and lived out his calling. So something else that we can learn is that God has specific call and purpose for each of our lives. Don't ever forget that. Each of us has a specific call and a specific purpose. If not, we wouldn't be here. So just remember that. John had a specific call and a purpose for his life. So let's read John 1, 19 through 27. It says, Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Finally, they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, not Elijah, nor a prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. And then again he repeats the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. So even when it was difficult, John continued with his purpose. He continued telling others, I am not the Messiah. You may think I am, but I am not. He knew what God's call was. He pursued it wholeheartedly. He was a strong and humble leader, and many people followed him, and many came to hear him preach. He didn't become proud or self-focused. He didn't live for the opinions of others, but lived to see others repent and turn towards God. And I think that, unfortunately, in church today, some people within the church become proud and self-focused. Um, and, and lose the whole meaning of what church is supposed to be. So John did not. He stayed um, humble, and he did not become proud. So Matthew 3.11 says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after he comes, one who is more powerful than I, and again he talks about here his sandals, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So again, he's pointing everyone away from himself, and pointing everyone to God. So something we can learn from those scriptures is that humility and obedience to God matters more than what others think of us. Humility and obedience to God matters more than what others think of us. And it's so true. You know, it doesn't... Other people's opinions of us do not matter. Only God's opinion. So we just need to remember that. So John was not afraid of religious or political leaders either. He saw beyond their exterior. He spoke the truth with clarity and passion. He didn't live to please people. He lived to preach the need for forgiveness of sins. He called out the Pharisees and Sadducees for what they truly were. He knew their hearts and lives were far from God. He called King Herod out in his inappropriate actions, and Herod threw John in prison. 
And then Herod later beheaded John. So John went to prison for standing and doing what he was supposed to do, for telling others of Jesus. He never faltered. He always did exactly what his calling was. And because of that, he was beheaded. Although John died a cruel death, it was not in vain. To live for Christ, to speak truth, is never in vain. John's purpose was complete. He lived out his calling, and he had prepared the way for Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So something we learn about John from these verses, no matter the battle, nothing we ever do for God is in vain. He is our hope and our deliverer. So that was one thing about John and his courage, that he, he called out those religious and political leaders. You know, he, he just told them the truth, but he called them out. And so he knew that whatever, you know, as long as he was speaking truth, that whatever happened, it didn't matter because God was his hope and his deliverer. So let's go back and we're going to want to re-say those things that we can learn from him. Like I said, we're going to dive into them deeper. So the first thing we said was God's timing is never late or early. God has specific call and purpose for each of our lives. Humility and obedience to God matters more than what others think of us. And no matter the battle, nothing we ever do for God is in vain. He is our hope and deliverer. So let's talk about the God's timing in our lives is never late or early. I think one of the hardest things for people is waiting. <laughs> you know, for me it's hard. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten better at it. Um, but we, we really need to understand that, um, you know, God's timing is perfect. That no matter what we want and no matter how we want it, it doesn't matter. He knows what's best. And if it's supposed to happen, it will, but in his timing. And he's never, ever late or early. It's always perfect. Always. You know, our, our hectic lives that we, we live, we think we have to live, makes it difficult to wait. You know, we have, a, we have smartphones. We have, we're instant everything. You want to know something, you just look it up. Within a minute, you know it. Um, and so the thought of sitting and being still right. is something I'm not very good at a lot of times. Um, but, you know, the, the being still and waiting is so very difficult. But Psalm 1830 says, as for God, his way is perfect. His ways are perfect. And I don't know about you guys, but I get in the way a lot. You know, I'll get in his way. Um, and so I, I really need to be still in his presence and um, gain some patience, which is a word that's kind of hard sometimes too. But patience comes when we learn to trust God. And often what appears to be a delay in receiving what you pray for, because God has something better. You know, I think about my life and all the things I've missed could have been better because I got in the way. I took a different path. should have just followed him. And I guarantee you my life would have been better if I would have just followed him. Um, but I didn't, and I'm sure there's some of you that are the same way. We only just listened the first time. I might eventually listen, but it's on down the road. <laughs> you know, it could have been here when I listened back there. You know, it could have been, it could have been a whole lot easier if I would have just been still and had let him plan it all out and follow him. <laughs> you know, another example of that is, you know, you didn't get the job that you wanted. You know, you, you go and you have this interview and you think, I did great, and you think that's what you want, the money's great, but you don't get it. But maybe because he's got something better for you. How about that house that you wanted? You know, we, <laughs> we were talking about moving, we want to get back out in the country because we live in the middle of the city now, and We've looked at houses and look at houses, but if anybody else is looking right now, the real estate market is crazy, and um, you pretty much have to put an offer in the day you see it. There's no thinking about it. And so, um, you know, I, the way I look at it, I told Randy, I was like, I just don't have a piece about it yet. 
you know, when we're supposed to move, when we're supposed to get that house, God will be there. He'll provide it. But again, that's us trying to go ahead of, of his plan. So again, we just have to be patient. And just remember, God's timing is never late or early. You know, he, he wants to use us. He wants to, um, you know, use us for his kingdom. And again, how many opportunities have we missed? How many opportunities have we missed? You know, God's intention may be to use us in what may appear to be minor ways. For example, you know, it takes many bricks to build a large building. And each brick has to be properly placed. And if it's not, what happens? It falls down. Just like our name is Cornerstone. That cornerstone of that building is so very important. But if everything is not constructed right, it's going to fall. So if our actions are not in line with God, what's going to happen? It's all going to fall apart. So being patient and waiting on God and his timing will help us stay in line with God and his plan, not only for our lives, but in the lives of others. And you've got to think about that too. Not only do we have to worry about our lives falling apart, but the ripple effects, you've heard me say that before, the ripple effects of those around us. You need to really, really think about that. We're all here for a specific point, in, at this specific point in time, to help prepare the way for Jesus, just like John. None of us are here by accident. We're all in this building for a reason. We're all at this specific point in time, November 28, 2021, for a reason. So you have a purpose. If there's anybody out there that don't think you have a purpose, you do. If you did not have a purpose, you wouldn't be here. So just remember that. So God has a specific call and purpose for each of our lives. That was something that we can learn from John. He's laid it out for us in the Bible. He makes it clear again and again that we are to love others, to care for the poor, to live our lives in such a way that everything we do and say points to him. 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. Just as God has called them, this is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. Whatever the situation. Not just when you walk in that door. You're not just a Christian when you're here. You should be a Christian wherever you go. So it says it right here. Each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. You know, your jobs are an assignment. You know, I have a regular full-time job, so... I am also there on assignment. You know, I've been able to witness and talk to my general manager on several different occasions. Even had her say, I want you to know this conversation impacted my life. Wherever you go, it could be in Walmart, like Randy likes to talk to everybody in Walmart. You know, it could it could be he does. Huh? Of course he does. That's right, Eli. He does. You know, he, he gets missing, and I find him talking to somebody on the aisle, and I'm like, what were you talking about? Jesus. It's like, okay. You know what I mean? But it's, it's wherever you are. It could be when you're grocery shopping. It could be in the parking lot. It could be any situation. It doesn't happen just here. Because as one of your pastors, I want to believe that all of you are saved. Now, I know that's not true. I want all of you saved. But this is not where our battlefield is. Our battlefield's out the doors. So, yes, we need to pray and we need to fight for each other in, in here, yes. But the biggest battlefield is out there. So you need to understand that you're called to, to that. That is your purpose. Wherever you are, whatever situation, we're all called into that mission for Christ. We've all been gained the same general assignment but our specific roles within us is unique. So what Sandy, her gifting is, is different than my gifting. What Caleb's gifting is, is different than my gifting. What Stephanie's gifting is, is different than mine. We're all unique. But just because we're unique does not mean that any of us are wrong. I think people get confused by that. They think, well, Sarah sings a whole lot better than I do. That's just not my, no. That's not it. You are part of the body. 
My gifting is part of the body. So never downgrade yourself because you're not as good as somebody else and what they're gifted in. That's not your gift. So you need to learn what your gift is so that you can build on that and be that strong part of the body. I just help out singing. There is much more gifted. But I just help. And she's shaking her head. It is true. Um, but I mean, that's, we all help each other, yes. But you need to build on your calling. There's none of us that are weak. There's none of us that don't have a purpose. We all do. You just need to dive into that and figure out what it is. Because the church needs you. The church needs all of us. You know, you come here on Sundays, and we're so thankful for that, that we're able to come together and we're able to worship together. But the big picture is, we've got to send you out. We're here to equip you, to, to make you better followers of God, you know, to make disciples who build their lives on Christ the cornerstone. That is our mission. Yeah. So that's what we're here to do, is to help build you up, to send you out. We all have a call and a purpose. And if you don't know what yours is, let's find out. Because the church, not our church, the church needs you. So now let's look at how we can find our calling. There's just a few things you can, to help find your calling. You know, again, as I said, as a church, we're here to help you with that. You know, a lot of times we can stand back and say, oh, they're really strong in that. Or we can see your gifting before you even realize it. Nathan, he calls me out sometimes, you're really strong in this, and you're really strong in that. I'm like, okay. You know, just because you are in it, you don't see it sometimes. So in order to find your calling, commit. You know, you really need to... Um, discern God's calling on your life, just, you have to, number one, die to self. (laughs) Put yourself out of the way. Um, Put everything else aside in order to put God first. That gets to the heart of who is in control of your life. Are you in control, or are you letting God in control? God has to be in control for you to find your calling. Because if you are in control of you trying to find your calling for God, It's not going to work. It's all going to be self-focused. You're going to be inward-focused. So commit. Commit yourself to God. Die to self. And then let him show you. And he will. Pray about it. We've had a lot of emphasis on prayer. Um, Prayer is so very important. You know, that's the way that God um, gives us the ability to discern his direction in our lives. And if you're confused about what God expects of you, pray. He will always tell you. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important prayer is. Um, I've had somebody reach out to me the other day about praying for them, and I did instantly pray for them. And if you don't realize it, that's the highest honor that anybody could ever ask of you. They're asking you to take you to the throne of God for them. Do you realize the importance of, of praying and how important it is when people ask you to pray for them. I mean, people don't realize that. They say a simple prayer, and it's, but they are specifically saying, will you pray for me? They're asking you to lift their name up to God. So it's an awesome, awesome responsibility. So whenever it's your time to find your calling, pray. Pray to him. Let him show you, because he will. And then prepare. Scripture provides us, Um, with this big blueprint for what God's doing in the world. And it gives us all these principles that we need to live our lives for his service. You know, fellow believers can offer guidance, insight, correction, practical tools, and great encouragement to us as we seek to discern God's will for our lives. You're not going to snap your finger and know what your calling is. you got to prepare for it. But by being around other believers, they're going to say, you're strong in this. You're strong in this, and it's something that you can look into, prepare for. Um, but just, you know, you, you just need to, you know, get guidance, um, insight, and just figure out exactly what your call is by preparing. And then obey. The Great Commission defined what makes disciples entail. It's teaching them to obey everything I have commanded in Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. It took me a while to obey my calling. Ran from it for a while. Calling's still there. (laughs) Who was running? Wasn't God. 
You know, so whatever your call is, it's still the same. Right. You're the one running from it. So you just got to obey. You've just got to, whatever he's called you to do, do it. The church needs to stand up. And we need to answer our callings. And we need to go out into the world and tell others. So just obey. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? It is easy. But we make it hard. And it's not. It's just not. <laughs> In the long run, it <laughs> definitely is. All right, something else that we can do to prepare for our calling. Act. <laughs> and I love this. God can't steer a parked car. Think about that. God can't steer a parked car. So if we're just sitting there doing nothing, right. he can't move us. Probably got our foot on the brake really, really hard. Right. Not wanting him to move us, right? right? So commit to serving him without conditions. And move in the direction of your gifts and your calling. Trust that God will steer and lead. Carrie Underwood has a song, Jesus Take the Wheel. Do it. <laughs> Let him have it. Let him have the whole, whole thing. You know, don't be over there with a brake on your side. You know, like the driver's own cars. Um, you know, let him have it. <laughs> let him have it all. So you cannot steer a parked car. We always need to be moving. And we always need to be doing something for him. And in order for you to do your call, you have to be moving. And you have to be willing. And then the last thing to think about is trust. We can't say that the place where we currently are, the task that is before us, insignificant to the larger mission. We are to trust that only God knows the full significance of the role he has called us to play in his greater mission. So we have to trust. Obey and trust. We make those things so difficult, and they're really not. Um, but trust is a big one. You know, we, um, I've gotten better at it, but I used to be like, I know how to do everything. I got it. I can handle it. Um, and I've gotten better. I'm still not 100% on that. But I've gotten better in trusting others. Um, and I think, you know, we've been hurt by people. We lose trust. I get it. But we should always trust God. He will never steer you wrong. He will never tell you wrong. He will never call you into something that you're not prepared for. So we have to trust. So commit, pray, prepare, obey, act, and trust. Now more than ever... We need people who are called. And again, like I said, all of us are called. Every single one of us are called. So now let's look at humility and obedience to God. That matters more than what others think of us. Humility and obedience, they go hand in hand. Without one, the other is nearly impossible. It's like the example of a child. You tell them to go clean their room, they stomp down the hall, slam the door, Eventually, the child has a choice. Right. You know, they can either humbly accept right. what their parents told them to do, right. or they can remain stubborn. Right. I'll probably remain stubborn. What? I was a child. I was stubborn. Um, but we too have a choice. When called by God to do hard things, we can cross our arms in defiance, <laughs> or we can humbly accept the command. It may take some wrestling through prayer, just as Jesus prepared, portrayed, sorry, portrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, but ultimately true obedience will follow humility. Did you remember that um, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane? I mean, he is praying. He's like, God, please take this from me, but your will be done. How many times have we prayed that? I have. God, please, just take this from me. Probably... I'm in that season right now. I'm like, Lord, I don't understand everything that's going on. You know, I don't understand why, um, you know, why my mom's going through what she's going through. I, I don't understand it. I don't, please just take this, take it from me, but your will be done. So there's nothing wrong with questioning. But then on the other side of that, we always have to remember that his will needs to be done. So 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, 
that he may lift you up in due time. He will lift you up in due time. Not your timing. He'll lift you up in his time. At that specific time, like we talked about earlier. Never early, never late. Okay? All right, the next one. No matter the battles we face, nothing we ever do for God is in vain. He is our hope and deliverer. So some people think that once you get saved, your life is rosy. As believers, we face probably more battles. Your target gets bigger on your back. We've talked about that some. You know, sometimes those battles are attacking our faith. Sometimes those battles are attacking our family. Sometimes those battles are our past trying to bring us back down. You know, all those battles are trying to keep us off track. The devil hates when we commit our lives to God. So he goes after whatever's closest to us. I can say that over the past year, a lot of my family has been attacked. And then the devil tries to play that on me. It's all because you're a minister. It's all because you decided to do this. That's the game he likes to play with me. That their attack is my fault. And I really have to check on that. It's like, no. No. Go away, devil. You know, that's, that's kind of the battle that, that I face sometimes. So, you know, you have your own battles. I know there's a lot of battles going on. Probably every single one of you has some sort of battle. Some of them I know about, and a lot of them I don't. But just know that he is your hope, and he is your deliverer. Nothing that we do for God is in vain. He will turn every single battle, every single valley, he will turn around for good. Never, ever forget that. So wherever you are, if you're on a hill, enjoy it. If you're in the valley, know you're not alone. Because he will turn that valley into a hill at some point. He will use that. Yes, he will. He will. So just remember, he is your hope and deliverer. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not vain. Never is it in vain when you're doing what God wants you to do. So those of us who are believers, we, like John, are called to prepare the way. That's one of our callings. You have other callings, but that's one of our callings, is to prepare the way like John. You know, he um, shared the news of Jesus coming. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, we are all called to share the news of Jesus coming again. We are all called to go and make disciples. We are to be like John. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, as one of your pastors, I really want to think that all of you that are hearing this message, that you're saved, that you're going to heaven with me. I want to believe that. But I know that's probably not reality. I want to tell you that, yes, John came to prepare the way for you, too. He came the way to prepare for Jesus, yes, but he came here to prepare the way for you. He came here to prepare the way for you. He came here to prepare the way for all of us. Just like Jesus came and died to prepare the way for all of us. He didn't come here to prepare the way for the people that lived back then. He came and died for each of us, to prepare the way for each of us. And I am also here to help prepare the way. Each one of us in here is here to prepare the way. He is coming back soon, very, very soon. And I want everybody here to go with me. I want everyone here to be on this mission with us of making disciples. I want each of you to be people who prepare the way. But if you're not saved yet, today's the day, people. <laughs> today should be your day to say, I am yours, Lord, use me. Today should be the day that you answer that call. Not all of you are called to be pastors. You might be called to teach something. You might be called to be security. You might be called to lead a small group. We all have different callings. 
But today needs to be the day that you figure that out too. So if you're not saved, let today be the day that forever changes your life. You know, we're, there's a lot of people here that would be glad to talk to you and love on you and help you. So let us do that. You know, let us, let us come to the altar and pray over you. You know, that's what the, the altar is just a representation. But I mean, there's something about it, about coming to the altar and praying and crying and letting it all out. I don't know what it is, um, but there is something about it. So if you are not saved, please let today, November 28th, be the day that changes your life forever. Do you realize there's a reason that you're here at this point in time? <laughs> you know, he wants to spend eternity with you. <laughs> That's why you were created. <laughs> you know, you were created to spend eternity with Jesus and with God in heaven. But he gives us free will. And he's not a forceful God. So he's not going to drag you. Right. He gives you the opportunity and you have to take it. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to do what he's asked us to do, is love God and love others. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So if you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior, do it today. Please realize that life without him is a life condemned to hell. You got two options, heaven or hell. And your decision today can decide that for you. Now, I'm not saying it stops here, because it don't. Yes, we want you saved, but we also want to help you grow. We also want to help you in relationships. We want to help you to go out and make those disciples. And that's one thing about a church family, is that we come alongside you and we help you. There are a lot of churches that just want you saved. Whoop, got that number. We got 10 saved today. That's great. But that's not where it stops. Where it starts. That's exactly right. That's where your new life, we talked, we sang new wine earlier. That's where he's going to start making that new wine out of you. So if you are not saved, this altar is going to be open during the last song. I will be here to pray with you. I know there's other people that will be glad to come up and pray with you. If you have questions, see some of them afterwards. You know, we're, we're here to help. If I don't know the answer, I'll get you the answer or find somebody that does. Um, but it just today should be the day. You know, Jesus came to prepare the way for each of us. He came so that we could spend eternity with him. He gives us that gift. Are you willing to take it? And if you're a believer, praise God. So thankful. But the church needs you. The church has been in the shadows for way too long. And we must take a stance. We must start preparing the way. You know, we, we do a lot of outreach, and I'm so very thankful for that. That's planting seeds. We talk about that a lot, too, around here, planting those seeds. Um, but we, we need to start preparing the way. Rededicate your life to God today. You might be saved, but you might have gotten comfortable and you're in that parked car. So maybe you re need to rededicate today. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, the church needs you. We need good, solid believers who are not scared to prepare the way, that's not scared to tell others. Start living out that love your neighbor as yourself. It's hard to do. Again, we get so busy in our lives. So just prepare the way. That is what I'm leaving you with. Help prepare the way. Whether it be for a family member, whether it be for somebody here at church, whether it be even yourself. <laughs> you know, you can help yourself prepare the way. But just do that. I'm going to end um, in a prayer, and some of you might recognize some of this, but it's verses I've put together as a prayer. So if you all will stand and join me.